Well, good morning, good morning. I am thankful. I really am thankful for this opportunity that we have together as the church just to reason before the Lord, to stand before him in this very moment, to join together, but to expect that he is going to give us direction. Agree with me as we begin. Lord God in heaven, Father, here on earth, would you work through us? Would you allow us to grasp what you have already ordained for this moment? That you would allow us, Lord God, to be encouraged. That you would allow us, Lord God, to be challenged. That you would allow us, Lord God, to each walk from this place, receiving from you what each of us may need in this day. Father, may we be blessed because we've been in your word. May we be blessed because we have been in your house. And Lord God, may we be blessed because we have gathered together with your people as you have commanded. And all God's people said together, amen. amen. Hey folks, um, we are excited and we've been talking about this new series since the week before Easter. We've been preparing. We've had these books for sale for $5. Anywhere else it's going to cost you $14.99. But we kind of got a connection with the Bible bookstore. So they helped us out a little bit. And then we had some scholarships to help out a little bit. And the reality is we've got the price down to an unheard of $5. So we're excited about that. I don't know. Are there... Um, Where's Christy? Were there any books left? Two. Two. We've ordered two or three times. And, and so if you don't have your book, get your book. And I'm excited because this is the Lou Giglio book titled Never Too Far. And the whole focus of this book is that in moments of disappointment, I want you to be honest. How many of you this week faced a moment of disappointment? Look around the room. You are not alone. So, so here's the thing. In these moments of disappointment, in, in these moments when, um, when discouragement or failure come our way, when we need God's direction, the reality is we're never too far from God's reach. And so as we are thinking through what that looks like, in this book there are biblical accounts and then there are modern day accounts of what it looks to have a comeback story. A comeback story is simply the fact that because of our own actions, maybe because of our sin, maybe because of our disobedience, maybe because of a hardened heart, but because of our own actions or on the total flip side, because of something you can't control at all. Maybe it's somebody else's actions. Maybe it's a disaster. Maybe it's an accident. Um, maybe it's an illness that, that, that just, just wiped you out, thrown you for a loop. So whether it's because of your own actions or whether it is something that, that you didn't do at all, either way, you find yourself in this valley. The reality is... We must never, never negate to put God in the middle of that equation. Even in the very worst circumstances, we have to make sure that we realize that we have God in the midst of the valley. And so when sin or circumstances has clouded your way so that you actually feel lost physically, you're not lost like you know what street you are on, but you are lost. You don't know what direction to turn. You don't know what to do. You don't know what the next moment is going to hold. The reality is God is waiting with open arms. 
And we have to get that thought, own that thought, believe that thought. He is waiting with open arms to hold us, to encourage us, to direct us, and to experience with us this valley. And then he will use our comeback story as he takes us through the filth, as he takes us through the shame, as he walks with us when we say, Lord God, this is my fault. Lord God, this isn't my fault. Lord God, I'm lost. Whatever the circumstances. He's right there waiting to exchange our plans for his perfect design, his flawless plans, his plans that never, ever fail. That's why I'm so excited about this book, Never Too Far. I want to tell you a little bit about the author, Lou Giglio, before we go any further so that you know a little bit about his story. He he is the lead pastor at Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia. This is a mega church, and what that means is they have more than 5,000 people in attendance. Matter of fact, every single Sunday morning they have three services, and they average anywhere from, well, well, about 7,000, so give or take 500 one direction or the other. So this is a big church, a very successful church. Lou Giglio graduated from uh, Georgia State University, and as a freshman in college, he made a decision that he needed to, he said it was about 2 a.m. one morning, and he realized, I, I, this party life, this college party life is going to lead me nowhere. And so he exchanged that life for a life of devotion to Jesus Christ. And and he went on to get a master's degree in divinity, and he studied at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. After college, it was 1985, and his very first ministry opportunity, he stepped out at Baylor University, and his task uh, was to create a college Bible study. So he and his wife, Shelly, began to do that. And right off the get-go, they had about 20 students. I don't know if you know much about college life, but uh, 20 students in a Bible study, college-age students, is a big deal. It's a big deal. But within a few weeks, weeks turned into months, 20 turned into 200. And then by the end of the year, 200 had turned into 1,600 students coming every single week to this Bible study. And so he had, the, the, Lou had this on his heart that he would do a conference where his college students could get together with college students from all around so that they could encourage one another. Let's be strong on our campuses. And so in 1997, they had their very first college conference in Austin, Texas. And within that moment, this first event, and I say first event because these uh, college gatherings are continuing now 24 years later. So uh, the passion movement began among these college-age students, age 18 to 25. Right before COVID hit, uh, beginning of 2020, the passion movement had a big conference in uh, Georgia, in Atlanta, and they had 65,000, not 6,500, get the zeros right, there are three zeros, 65,000 thousand college students in attendance. 54 countries were represented. 2,000 different colleges and universities had students present. This is an amazing thing. These students gave and they donated three million, well, three million, two point five eight, over three million dollars for the cause of, of child labor human trafficking, and the sex slave trade. That's impressive. Louis Giglio is also the creator of Six Steps Records. This is a record label that signs uh, Chris Tomlin. They have the David Crowder Band, Matt Redman, Charlie Hall, and several others. Uh, Lou Giglio is an author of several best-selling books. 
But he also has authored some worship songs, songs that we actually sing here at Thursday Church, The Air I Breathe and How Great Is Our God. Those are both his uh, songs. It appears that just about everything this man touches turns to gold. Just, just, he, he, he's just, he's gold. <laughs> and he says that it is his claim to fame, it is his honor to help make Jesus Christ famous. He recognizes that Jesus is famous all on his own, but that it is his honor as a pastor. It is his honor to focus on young people, ages 18 to 25, and their walk with Christ. And I share all of that, not because we are here to worship Lou Giglio, I share all of that for the reality that when we look at this man's life, it appears to be perfect. It appears that, that he has this perfect life. He's got this perfect wife. He's got these perfect children. I'm guessing he even has a perfect dog. He has this, this perfect home. He has this perfect career. He has a perfect staff. They all love and adore him. <laughs> everything, everything seems to be perfect. It's as if doors open when they see him walking near. They just fly open to him. And with all of this success, because no doubt, this man is a huge success, with all that the world can offer him, it could not protect him. His success could not save him. His success could not keep him from a very, very dark season of life. To this day, he says that from time to time, he still struggles with the real life battle against anxiety and depression. Depression? He has it all. And yet, the reality is when the world says everything looks perfect, my friends, that doesn't mean that it protects you from something as horrific as the valley. And he walked through a very, very dark valley. But the good news, the good news for him and the good news for us is that Jesus Christ, not our success, not the accolades, not the title behind your name, but Jesus Christ is the one that redeems us from the very worst circumstances that life can throw at us, whether it is because of our own doing or whether it is just because of life circumstances. Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the one that, that offers us mercy and compassion in the valley. He is the one that offers us forgiveness and grace in the valley. He sought medical help. He sought clinical help. Things didn't seem to be changing much. They weren't sure exactly what to do with him. But without his foundation of his faith in Jesus Christ, there wouldn't be a book never too far. Without his foundation and his faith in Jesus Christ, there wouldn't be a comeback story. The foundation of every single comeback story is that faith in Jesus Christ is what gets you through nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less, just Jesus. Faith in Jesus Christ is what gets us through. There will be times when it seems as if there is no way. You, you cannot find your way. And only God can show you the way. There will be times when sorrow will be so deep that it will roll over you like the fury of the waves. If you've ever stood at the ocean and watched the power of the waves, there will be times in all of our lives where sorrow will roll us over like those powerful waves. 
when addiction grips your mind and will not let go, when it clings to you, when the one you trusted has betrayed you, taken your trust and stomped all over it, I've had this happen in my life. I've, I've, I've trusted and been betrayed. And I'm here to tell you, this is, this is a deep hurt. I'm not going to make you hold up your hands, but I'm guessing a lot of you could say that is your testimony also, that you have been hurt, that you have been betrayed, that you know what that feels like, how overwhelming that can be. When there seems to be no way, when sorrow overwhelms, when addiction grabs hold, when trust has been broken, when there seems to be that your path is so clouded that you do not know if you are going forward or backward or to the right or to the left, when you feel as if you are lost, that is when faith will determine how you will move forward. That's when faith will cause you to know that you can stand that you can plant your feet and you can stand. The cloud may be all around you, but you can stand. Oh, Lord, haste the day when my faith shall become sight. The clouds will be rolled back like a scroll. The trump shall sound and the Lord shall descend. Hear me. The Lord shall descend. Because it is well with my soul. Not my circumstances. Not my situation. I might be in the midst of this cloud. But I can stand. And I can be determined to know that it is well with my soul. And so in this breath. I will trust even when life's circumstances seems to grab hold. The Bible is full of story after story after story of comeback stories. Adam and Eve, Noah, Moses, Joseph, Elijah, Elisha, Anna, Daniel, Esther, Samuel, Samson, Solomon, Hannah, Ruth, Mary Magdalene, Martha, Tamar. My friends, I hope you know their stories. I hope those aren't just names. I hope you're in God's word and you know their stories because they all have comeback stories. Page after page after page of God's word is filled with comeback stories. And if you are part of the human race, which I'm guessing if you are here today, you're part of the human race. And what that means is every single one of us will face trials and struggles. We will walk through the valleys and sometimes it will be because of our own fault because of our own sins we're all going to walk through a valley or two Romans 3 23 says for all of us have sinned we have all fallen short of the glory of God if you've been in church any time at all you have heard that proclaimed but let me tell you what verse 24 goes on to say yet God in his grace he makes us right in the midst of the cloud, he makes us right in his sight. Don't worry about the world around you. Don't worry about what they are saying. Don't worry about what they are thinking. Because we are made right in his sight. And he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. Freed. He broke your chains. Those things that are holding you, that sorrow, that distrust, all of those things. He can break those chains if we are standing in faith. My friends, we are all candidates. Every single one of us are candidates for a comeback story. That is, you know how there's always a but? Here's the but of the story. We are all candidates of a comeback story. That is, if Jesus Christ is part of your story. If he is part of your story. That's when your faith has sight in the midst of the cloud, in the midst of the valley. 
See, having faith, I want you to hear this, it doesn't mean that the valleys disappear. Having faith doesn't mean that the trials won't come your way, that sorrows won't happen, that people won't break your trust. That's not what it means to have faith. What it means to have faith is that in the midst of that overwhelming heartache, hardship, and struggle, that Jesus is there with you. John 14, 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift. These are the words of Jesus. This is what Jesus said. I'm giving you this gift. Please receive it. Please take it. Please hold on to it. Please open it. Please own it. It is yours to have. I am giving you this gift. And the gift is peace of mind and heart. He wants to give your heart and your mind peace, my friends. He didn't say I'm going to take away all the struggles. He didn't say that your life wouldn't have trouble. He said, even in the midst of that, I'm giving you a peace, peace of mind, peace of heart. You know, Thursday, when, when, when I'm right in the middle of this scripture, I thought, I need to say, I can proclaim that as my testimony, that I have peace of mind and heart. And I thought, man, that sounds like I'm bragging. And God worked on me all stinking weekend. And he said, little missy, if I have given you something, don't you dare, don't you dare shy away worrying about what someone might say about you. Oh, she's boastful. Oh, she's prideful. No, I'm not. I'm filled with a peace that can only come from Jesus Christ no matter my circumstances. And I am here to testify, this is good stuff, my friends. This is good stuff. And the peace that I give you, the peace I give you is a gift. And the world cannot give this to you. Quit looking to the world to give you peace. It will not happen. It comes from Jesus Christ. So do not be troubled and do not be afraid. Can I get an amen right there? Mm. Okay, so this book, Never Too Far. As we are reading through, Louis defines this fearful, strange rhythm that consumed his soul. His nights were filled with these, what he called, clouds of dread. He would wake up and he would just have these clouds of dread. His heart would be racing. His blood pressure would skyrocket. He had numbness in his face. And his nights continued to be interrupted. His sleep continued to be interrupted. And no one could figure out what was going on with him. Because all of his test results came back that there was nothing physically wrong with him. And yet all of this continued to happen. This fret and this dread. They tried all kinds of medications, all kinds of different things. And then one night, this is what he did. Then one night, in the midst of the dread, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of this overwhelming anxiety, this cloud, he decided to add a song of praise. He simply began saying, be still, my soul, there is a healer. Be still, my soul, there is a healer. Now, my guess is... If he is uh, someone who writes worship music, he's probably uh, got some ability to have some kind of rhythm himself. And so I'm guessing he's turned this into some kind of song in his soul. Be still, my soul. There is a healer. That's the only thing he changed on that, that particular night. And in a moment, while he's giving this praise, while he is saying that, Lord, you are my healer. You, Lord, you're the one that can, can bring peace to my soul. In that moment, there was, there was a pause from the dread and the anxiety. From the cloud, there was a pause right there in the midst of the fear. Right there in the midst of the anguish and all he did was add this song of praise and God took that song of praise from this man that the world calls very successful God took that song and he began to very slowly replace fear anxiety fret and depression with moments of peace now it didn't fall away all at once it didn't work that way for him. What happened was slowly, little by little, he had moments in the dread of peace. 
And this process continued night after night. And these moments became longer and more persistent. And the fear and the anxiety began to become shorter and to subside. It was a process of God working on his heart. God working on his faith. This godly man. God was still working on him. I want you to hear that. There have been folks who've been in church all their life and they're still struggling with something. I want you to hear what this man has to say. And he he says two things in the book that I really like. And he he just whizzes by them real quickly. First, you are not crazy. And second, you are not alone. And I thought, this first, you are not crazy. My guess is when you are filled with this kind of depression, you feel as if you are crazy. He doesn't say that, but I'm guessing that's what you feel like. Like you were just overwhelmed. Like the world looks at you and says, this is nuts. You're crazy. Especially as he's going to these medical people and they're saying, there's nothing wrong with you. I don't know why your blood pressure is doing this. I don't know why your heart is racing. I don't know why your face is going numb. I don't know. Maybe you're nuts. So he's saying, you're not crazy. This this fear and this anxiety, it's real. And second, he says, you must realize you are not alone. See, God goes before us, no matter our circumstance. He always goes before us. So even in the darkest valley, especially in the darkest valley, we need to recognize, Lord God, I know that you are before me. I don't know that you will never leave me nor forsake me. I know, Lord God, that you want my life to be blessed. He wants your life to be blessed. This isn't a, uh, this, this, this prophecy of, of, of financial wealth and all that kind of stuff. This is the reality that God wants to work in your life and he wants you to have peace and he wants you to have this, this overwhelming comfort that can only come from him. So when we find ourselves in moments where our soul feels as if it is debilitated, we must get in the habit of first turning to him. And I do that by turning to scripture. I do that by quieting myself in prayer. I do that by, by I'm not really a, a, much of a singer, but, but for you who are singers, you would probably do that by, by singing praise, by taking pause and saying, Lord God, help me be reminded of who you are in my life. Help me be reminded that you go before me. And when we do that, when we take pause, that's when our faith is developed See, no matter what ails you, no matter what troubles you, no matter what valley you are walking through or what distresses you, faith is what heals you, period. Faith is what heals you. Say that with me. Faith is what heals you. You know, um, in my Bible, next to Psalm 43.5, I have written that uh, faith is my Solution. I know it's a little corny, but it works for me. When my soul needs to be reminded, this is my solution for my soul. It reads Psalm 43 5 Why am I discouraged? Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again because he is my Savior and my God. Now, if you don't have a go-to passage, you can take mine. Psalm 43, 5. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again. I will praise him. Take your hand and let's just practice together what it feels like to praise him. Take your hand and do this. Do this number. I will praise him. Say it with me. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. That felt good, didn't it? It felt good. Faith is the solution to your soul. I am running short on time. But I'm going to ask you to give me five more minutes, okay? 
Five more minutes. Open a Bible real quick. Let's do this quickly. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. And this is Solomon's amazing comeback story. And I don't want to walk out of here without sharing it for, from you because this is another man who seems to be extremely successful who messes up. And so, so we heard about Lou Giglio's. This was not by his own ex, uh, uh, sin that caused this. For Solomon, what's coming his way was because of his own sin. He makes a huge mistake. He is a young king, probably about 18, 19, early teens, could be early 20s. But nonetheless, this is a very young man. And he has become king. And he is king over this mighty nation, and a nation that is too big to count. And he, he wants to do the right thing. He wants to honor God. And so he's watched what his father did. And instead of listening to God, he listened and did what his father had always done. Sometimes this happens in our life, where we watch our parents instead of listening to God. But God had made it very clear that Solomon, you are to build a temple. Early in his uh, leadership, the temple began, and after a few months, they were beginning to worship there. It's going to go on for seven years, the building of the temple. But early on, God said, there, that now this is the place where my people will come together to worship. This is it. This is the place. No longer shall you go offer your sacrifices at the high places. The high places were, were very uh, public places. Usually, the, then duh, they're called high places because they were high so everyone could see them. So it would be like on a mountain or on a hill. Um, and so in these high places, they would offer their sacrifices. And everyone would. Well, the, the, all the kings and all of the, the, uh, the idols that they worshipped and all these false teachings came together at the high places. And so not only were people giving their sacrifices to God at these places, but they were giving sacrifices to all kinds of gods. And God said, "Uh uh-uh, my people, no, 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 no. You don't need to be mixed with false worship. You you don't need to be hearing teaching that is not true. You need to be separate in your worship. This time where we gather together, my friends, this is for us. This is for the edification of the church, and it's important. And so he said, from this point forward, you're going to gather together in the temple and you're going to offer your sacrifices there but Solomon he gets he he he's young and so he he goes to the high place and he makes a a huge sacrifice a big old show he sacrifices a huge amount to his God that he loves and adores and God is going dude didn't I give you instruction This isn't about what what you are offering so the world can see. This is about so that God's people know that we need to come together. We need this place of purity. We need this place of holiness. We need this place where we gather together as God's people. Amen. Okay, so here we go. Verse 7. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father David. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way. And here I am in the midst of your chosen people, a nation so great and numerous that we can't even count them. He's making, he's making a public apology. He's saying, I don't know why I did what I did. I don't know what I'm doing. Verse 9, give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and so that I can know the difference between right and wrong. How often are we willing to say, I don't know the difference between right and wrong? I have misstepped. I'm sorry, God. I I, I did something publicly for the world to see instead of privately for your praise and for the edification of your church. I don't know what I'm doing, he says. For who among himself is able to govern this great people of yours? And the Lord was pleased with Solomon that he had asked for wisdom. My friends, in the midst of a very huge mistake, a very big public mistake, God said, I see your heart. I hear your confession. I receive it. And he says that he's pleased. And that ought to encourage you. So God replied, because you've not asked Because you've asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice. And you've not asked for a long life or for wealth or even for the death of your enemies. I will give you what you have asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart. So as that no one else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for. I will give you riches and fame. No other king in the world will ever compare to you for the rest of your life. 
And if you follow me, and here's the but, here's the yeah, yeah, I'm pleased right now. Yes, I have a plan for you, and it is good. But you have a responsibility. Church, we have a responsibility. If you follow me, and if you follow my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Faith. That's where your comeback story is based. Faith is what gets you through the storm. Faith is what, it's what allows you to walk through the valley when everything is falling apart and still have peace. Ask God if this is the only thing you remember. Remember this. He has said we can ask him. Ask him for wisdom to see his hand. Ask him for wisdom to know. Ask him for wisdom to discern right from wrong so we don't keep stepping in what is wrong. And then ask him to give you the strength to follow and to follow with faith. This morning we have the opportunity to witness those who are following with faith doing exactly what God has asked them to do, and that is to follow in baptism. Jesus Christ himself was baptized, and he said, here is water. Why, why shouldn't I be baptized? And you can imagine John, no, 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 you should baptize me. And Jesus is going, if, if I'm asking it of you, I'm going to demonstrate it myself. And so Jesus himself was baptized, and he said, this is a mark where you say publicly to the world. Their baptism was done out in the river. Everyone could see. And you say, I have made this decision. I'm, I am dead to my sin. That's what going under that water means, where you can't take a breath under here. I am dead to my sin. And you rise out of that water new. The symbolic message is very powerful. In Christ, we are made new. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father God, we have the opportunity today to see you at work in the lives of these people who are making this public commitment. We trust you, Father God, that you'll take the words that you have shared this morning through, through my mouth and through my study, that you'll use them, that you'll use them in my life and in the lives of those who hear Father, may we be people who realize that, that faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, is our solution. It is where we will find our strength. It is where we will find life. It is where we will be renewed and restored and given direction. It is where we will faithfully pursue a life filled with your goodness and your peace. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. And we pray, Lord God, asking that if there is one among us who is yet to make that declaration, that today would be the declaration. Today would be the day where they would say, here it is, May the 2nd, and this is the day that I will forever be changed. I will forever be made new. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, just, just this opportunity for you to just privately slip your hand in the air to the Lord and say, that is my proclamation. I see your hand. I see your hand. Amen. 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 I see your hand. And all God's people said together, amen. amen. If you are getting baptized, meet me over here. If you didn't sign up, it's a nice warm day. If you're ready to make this proclamation, I'll send you home with a towel. How's that?